Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Winkler, and I'm the Meeting Systems Coordinator for the Equipment Leasing and Finance Association. On behalf of ELFA, it is my pleasure to introduce today's Wednesday webinar, Candid Conversations in Diversity, moderated by Dr. Hakeem Olishe, sponsored by Visual Lease. Today's session will be recorded and will be available later this week. If you have a question for our speakers, please type it into the questions panel. We will leave time for Q&A after the presentation and address as many questions as time allows. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. Joining us today is Christopher Johnson, SVP and President, Global Financial Services at Pitney Bowes, Delroy Stauffer, Senior Marketing Associate at Odessa, Justin Foster, the Chief Diversity Officer, VP Inclusion, Equity and Belonging at DLL, and Lexi Dressman, Assistant Vice President, Counsel at Huntington Equipment Finance. Full speaker bios are available in the handouts panel. And last but not least is today's moderator, Dr. Hakeem Olishei, who you will hopefully recognize from last week's special webinar presentation. Dr. Olishei is an internationally recognized science TV personality and global education advocate who has had a long distinguished career in academia and scientific research. He is the author of the highly anticipated memoir, A Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey from the Street to the Stars. Most recently, Dr. Olishei was stationed at NASA headquarters, where he served as an astrophysicist and space science education lead. A former TED fellow, Dr. Olishei holds three degrees, eight U.S. patents, four EU patents, and co-hosts several shows on the Science Channel and Discovery International, including Outrageous Science, How Universe Works, and Strip the Cosmos. Dr. Olishei, the floor is yours. And if we could go ahead and get you on mute real quick. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. It's just like, uh, you know, just like the pros are doing it. We're all muted <laughs> in the, our, our new world. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I just want to say that I love the way that ELFA is doing this particular session. Um, I think that, you know, when we discuss things, sometimes we get caught up in the abstract. But in reality, right, we're all living our daily lives. We're all humans. We all have a story to tell. And I think the more that we tell each other and listen to each other, our stories, then uh, the better we'll understand each other and the closer we'll come to achieving our ideals. So let's start with Christopher Johnson, sir. So let's talk about your experience in your industry so one of the things that i often hear uh said which kind of gets at me is this sort of thing like oh you know such and such happened because of my color right or my because of my sex and my thinking is that you know when you run into someone who's kind to you you're the same color or sex as when you run into someone who's not or sexuality, whatever the case may be, right? So it's not you that's changing. It's the person you're interacting with that's changing. So it seems like what's happening to you is more about them than it is to you, than it is you. So with that in mind, let's think about some of your experiences that you've had in your industry that you think are sort of, I would say minority specific, but it's really not just about who you are, right? It's about the other person in, in that interaction. So the floor is yours, sir. Sure. And I'm uh, first of all, let me just say thanks for having me on. It's been uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be a part of this. I think these uh, sessions are <clears throat> a really great thing uh, for our industry as well as for all the professionals that uh, we get a chance to work with. Um, as it relates to uh, some of the experience, let me just start with one and we can maybe talk about it. Um, you know, I think sometimes it's the simple things in life that that matter. Right how uh, your interactions are shaped right at the onset when you get a chance to meet and engage with people. So I myself have been leading businesses, uh, financial services uh, businesses around the world for a, uh, um, a good period of time. And uh, truth be told, there are very few uh, black uh, leaders uh, of financial institutions uh, in general, and for sure, when you look at our industry, uh, very few um, that are inside of uh, sort of what is it that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. What I find to be interesting, and it's, uh, I think it's a very simple and subtle aspect of how race comes into play from time to time and bias, right? Unintended bias comes into place from time to time. 
is in my role or my capacity, I'm always in the market talking to whether it's uh, vendors or suppliers, or you talk to partners, or you uh, have an opportunity to speak with companies that uh, you'd be doing business with, customers, et cetera. And one of the things that I find, um, you know, that happens uh, a lot, probably greater than 90% of the time, is that if I walk into a room and if I'm with a colleague of mine, let's say, who is white um, or another race, uh, they would say, generally speaking, the, the people who we're meeting with, they will approach the other person and they will say, well, oh, you must be Christopher, right? And it's just the subtle assumption, right? That a black man would not be a leader of a financial institution uh, someone that they would be partnering with or working with. It's a subtle concept, but it's something as simple as that that demonstrates how sometimes unintended bias, right, comes into how we present and interact with other folks. Question for you, sir. When that happens, how do you feel? So, you know, at first, I probably gone through a couple different uh, emotions around it, right? At first it was anger, right? Um, I think the anger has sort of faded as I've become very used to it, right? Um, now it's a matter of, uh, it makes you feel sometimes inferior, right? It makes you feel smaller as an individual and it creates a bit of a chip, right? Um, on, your soul, on your shoulder as it relates to wanting to demonstrate that this is not a mistake, right? Uh, that people of all races, walks, creeds, backgrounds can have competency um, in our neighborhood, which is financial services. One thing I'd like to, to, to bring light to there is you brought in a time component, right? How you reacted at first, but then how it evolved. Right. And, and, and so what, one way I would relate to that is a story I would tell people, and it has to do with police stops. Right. So it's sort of like, at least where I was, a coming of, uh, 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 what, what does that call Like coming of age where you cross various thresholds. What is that called? Anyway. I'm for the phrase, but we get you. Yeah, the phrase, yeah. right? So when I first stopped, started getting stopped by police, I thought it was cool, right? Now, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm advancing to a new stage of adulthood, right? But after the 30th time, it's not cool anymore, right? And so is that, you know, so I think sometimes when people hear a life example, they look at it in an, in an isolated way. Oh, that happened, but does it really mean that, right? And I, and, I, and I guess what you're saying is there is a trend of this behavior over and over that makes it to you say, it has something to do with something that is visible because there's nothing else. Yes, for, for sure. And so I'll build on this, okay? Um, another simple example, right, that, um, that I would share with you. This one probably hurts more, right, uh, than what I said before, but um, as you progress in your career and you take on, um, you know, more and more uh, aggressive roles of accountability and responsibility um, in your business and in industry. Um, one of the things that you get afforded as an executive a lot of times is uh, the value of coaching development. You also get a lot of time with the other senior leaders, whether it be in your company or, or um, around your industry, uh, to help to continue to uh, build your capabilities, uh, which is all great things. Okay? One of the things that I've been told along the way that a number of institutions, and it's always taken me aback, and people have said it to me wanting to come from a positive place, wanting to come from a place of good to say, I care about you, and therefore I want you to continue to progress, but I want you to be aware of something, right? And this awareness is, well, you know, Christopher, you, um, you, you could be misinterpreted very easily, right? And then I say, well, why is that, right? They're just common English words that we're talking about. Yeah, but you know, you're, you're black, 
and um, you, you're kind of a big guy, right? So because my gene pool is six foot three and a half, 230 plus pounds, right? I have to change the way I interact with people, how I can communicate with folks. And so I've had to learn this behavior in order to excel in my career. Oops, I think my might on mute. Yeah, it's on mute. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I'm an astrophysicist, and there is a, a female astronomer named Jarita Holbrook, African-American woman, brilliant. She knows like five or six languages, uh, got her undergrad degree from Caltech and her grad degree from UC Santa Cruz. And she says to me one time, she goes, Haki, have you ever noticed that you're the only successful African-American male astronomer who's of tall stature and also who doesn't have a high-pitched voice? And this has come up in, in numerous occasions. And one time she said, yeah, and the only reason, Hakeem, why you survive is because you're goofy, right? And then someone, and I say, goofy, right? I, I, I can take a joke. I, I love to laugh at myself. But she goes, well, what I mean to say is you have this self-deprecating humor that puts people at ease, right? And so this is a phenomenon that even though I've lived my entire life as a large Black man, I didn't realize that this was going on in people's heads, right? Um, but anyway. Let's go to our next person. Let's go up to the next person. I, I, I calculated, I did some math, five people, 60 minutes, that's 12 minutes each. So let's go to Delroy. So Delroy, you have your own uh, personal experience that I don't, you know, there's no way I can kind of tee it up without giving it away. So I'm just gonna say go because, you know, it's, it's one of those things, but it's your personal experience. Sure. No, that's that's great. So I want to echo kind of what, what Christopher said. Thanks, obviously, for, for having me on this. When when I was originally invited, I was honestly a little bit nervous because I was like, what, you know, unlike Christopher, I haven't you know been um, directly discriminated against, at least not based on the color of my skin. I'm also 5'8 and 165, so different stature as well. But yeah, I've, I've never been directly discriminated against based on the color of my skin. So I was like, what what experiences when thinking through, you know, how I grew up? could I use to, to help people as they navigate unconscious bias or just really their own journey of, of being the best person they can be. And so I was thinking back over the course of, of my life and, and two stories really stuck out to me. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know me, I grew up um, a Mennonite, which is, is pretty close to basically Amish, no television or computers or, or anything like that, um, being homeschooled. Um, with three younger siblings. And my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was um, just going into the sixth grade. And so um, it was made, my parents made the decision to send us to private school about 30 minutes away from our little tiny farm in rural Pennsylvania. We had to travel about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to the local school. And so my siblings and I um, go to our, our first our first day of school and we're all super excited and and to to kind of set the story up a little bit my you know obviously my name is delroy um but my siblings names are jared devon is his middle name terrell moshe and sheree benet so just stop right there and picture in your mind what you think me and my siblings look like um if you obviously hadn't met me and so um you know, as we walk into to school this very first time and we're all walking arm in arm, you know, it's obviously a, a little tiny private school. So it's grades one through 12. So we all go in the entrance and the principal, she greets us at the front and she walks up and stops. And she's like, oh, I, she said, I thought we were getting our very first African-American family. And I look at my siblings and I'm like, no, why would you, why would you think that? No, nope, we're definitely white. And, and, and it just bumped over it. And, and it's a funny story I would sometimes tell people. And, and I hadn't thought of it for years and years and years, because to me, those are my siblings' names. I called them that every single day. My mom used the middle name if she was angry with us. So like I was, I grew up hearing it. It wasn't until actually years later when I graduated college my very first interview at my very first job out of undergrad, um, the hiring manager came in to interview me and he goes, oh, this, you're not what I expected. Um, and I was like, 
what do you mean by that? And he goes, oh, you know, never mind. And continued to interview me. And in the back of my head, I was like, oh, and I had a flashback to that story. And I was like, I know exactly what he meant. Um, he assumed that he was going to be interviewing a, a Black person. And so just very interesting of, of just something as simple as a name, how it can have a, a huge impact on what we automatically think of when we think of, of someone else, when we just see that. Um, so yeah, just just an interesting and then kind of something that I think a lot of people relate to if they truly think of that. You know, one, one interesting thing, Delroy, is uh, I remember reading a book some years ago and the author wished to address whether or not um, the names that African-Americans give their children impact them negatively economically, as some people believe. Um, and the answer he found was no, it do, they do not. But in order to do the study, he had to define what is a black name, what is a white name. And so they defined them based on, let's look at Los Angeles birth records and let's see what names black people name their kids and no one else does. Let's see what names white people name their kids. And, uh, so anyway, the, the, the blackest male names all start with D.E. <laughs> Deshaun, DeAndre, okay. you know, the Christopher, Delroy. All right. Be money. <laughs> yeah. But you mentioned something earlier. Your background, your upbringing is not, you know, standard Americana, right? It's a slice of Americana. So once you left your home community, have you found anything? Uh, have you found the people you interacted with in the workplace? to um, bring attention to this in ways that made you uncomfortable or made you feel different in any way? Um, you know, honestly, you know, you're right. It was it was such a bubble that I grew up in as the small slice of America. And obviously you can't keep your kids in that bubble forever. And so I remember in college, people would mention it all the time in a joking manner. They would be like, you know, your name is is so black. Like people would tell that to me all the time. And if they heard my siblings' name, especially, they would they would say that because Cherie Benet and Terrell Mache are basically, you know, like they would be like, Terrell actually is named after Terrell Owens um, mm -hmm. from the Miami Dolphins. So he's actually named after someone. So they would, people would say that all the time. Fortunately, or, or you know, I've never been like, in my knowledge, directly discriminated against because of my name. Like the hiring manager, for whatever reason, although thinking, that I was African American or Black when he saw my name, didn't then take the next step and say, oh, I'm not going to interview this person or, or, you know, automatically unqualified me because of the color of my skin. So as far as I know, the interviews I haven't gotten, it hasn't been because of my name, but then again, it might have been. So yeah, no really direct kind of influence. And, and what's very interesting is like, as much as it was a bubble, we grew up very much accepting of of all people which which i was thinking about like how did i grow up what was my parents message and i remember time and time again they would say all people are created equal and special and and one of the things that made me know that that they had instilled that into us and then i carry that with me to today is after my mom passed away from cancer um when i was about 15 my dad, a couple years later, you know, time heals, he started going on dates with people again. And one time he comes back from one of these dates and tells my siblings and I that he went on a date with an African-American woman. And we're all super excited. And my, my young, my, my second brother, he would have been 13 at the time. He's like, please tell me she has a boy because I want to have an NFL player as a brother. And just like the innocence and beauty in that made me realize that I, racism or, or even unconscious bias, they're programmed. They're not born into us. We learn those things. He, he made a stereotype, yes, but it was from a place of like genuine innocence and, and wanting to have like, because he's into soccer and football. He loves sports. So to have an NFL player as a brother would have been amazing to him. So just coming from a place of innocence but really a reminder i think to all of us to to take a step back when we picture you know who the the person is that we're going to be meeting based on their name or or any other thing we know about them before we meet that person themselves yeah that reminds me of another study where they wish to uh see how early in life 
uh, these sort of thoughts get into our minds. Um, and they had kids answer questions like, you know, which is which is the pretty doll, that thing, right? Remember, I think a lot of people have seen that. Um, yeah. So this is this is a force that 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 you know starts really really young. So I think that we need to be intentional in how we counter it. But you know, there's a lot of things that you know we can't really address because well, I mean, we address this, but how do we address it with the very young, right? It, it's something that must take place in families. I you know, and and so you know, I think a lot of families believe ignoring it is you know, like you say, you were taught to be accepted of all people. Was that done in an intentional way or was it done by saying, okay, we're not gonna be tribal in any way? Um, no, I think it was It was very intentional because for us, it was very biblical. Being Mennonite, it was very much like everyone is created in God's image. We're all, you know, the little song of red, brown, yellow, black, and white, they're precious in his sight type of thing growing up. So we were, from like a Christian perspective, taught that way now whatever stereotypes and things like that are then taught outside. So once we started going to school or once we were kind of released from that bubble, some of those things started infiltrating us, I'm sure. But I think from the core, my parents did a great job and, and I hope to do a similar job with my children because we really didn't even see color, which I know is not the term now, it's more of like celebrate color, but really truly we didn't really even acknowledge it um, because it was, so normal to us or, or taught to be accepting to us. So, yeah. you, you, you make your you make your acknowledgments at the species level. Hello, my fellow human. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, it doesn't matter gay, woman, man, black, white, doesn't matter. It's like, hi, human. Have you so I took that bias test once upon a time, uh, a few times, and I come up with it's really interesting because overall I come up with a uh, no bias and I'm like in a very, very tiny percentage. But when it comes to children, it's different. And it says that I have a bias towards black children. I don't know. I don't know how to does it. Anyway, on to the next. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Justin, you, sir, are unique here in the sense that you actually are, it's a part of your job to address these issues. And you also lived abroad, which, you know, for me was it happened for the first time at the age of 30 and talk about eye-opening, it completely changed uh, my perspective forever. So uh, please, sir, share with us your experience. Sure, so um, echo my colleagues, well, thank you, uh, happy to be here. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate um, to be to live an international life, I think. So um, my wife is from uh, Scotland. She was born in the UK, um, has been in the United States for about 10 or 12 years. What's interesting, I'll take you all the way back to when I first met her and we first started to date. And um, one of the very interesting questions I asked her first date was, do your, problem, do, your, do your parents have a problem with me being black? And she was so, offended by that in the moment um and she said why would you ever ask me that and i had to spend some time educating her on you know throughout college it has been very commonplace for me to date and have to be a secret or have to be not shared or we don't share pictures on social media because her family would feel some kind of way and i was over that at that point in my life and i kind of said you know i just I want to be up front. I, I don't want to go too far down this path, um, get emotionally involved, and then have this, this hurdle. Luckily, I couldn't be any more uh, wrong in that situation. And, and her, her family, who, who still live in the UK, um, you know, are the, the, the best in-laws you can ask for, um, absolutely. Um, we have two children. We have two boys. Um, we, so we were raising two uh, biracial um, young men in this world, which is America, which is interesting, and we think about all the time, how do we make sure that they understand both of their cultures? And how do they make sure that they are, they're going to be black passing, um, so they will be in situations that others will not be? And how do they navigate through those situations? And even at, you know, two and a half and 10 months, we're trying to figure out how do we surround you with um, books and literature and, and all the things so that we're educating them from a very young age. And so I have on my desk, I just came from Amazon, 
the ABCs of equality. And so going through and teaching him the ABCs with words that have to do with inclusion and, and, and equity, because I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, then we, uh, I was a trailing spouse, um, an expat spouse, and we moved to Germany and we spent some time in Germany for a while. And I shared uh, earlier, it's, it's completely different being a black man in America, being a black man in Germany. It was like um, when I would walk down the, the streets, because we did a lot of walking in Europe, um, it would be like a parade. Like people did not understand what they had just seen walk down the street <laughs> um, with our biracial family. And, you know, I think it's what's interesting about bringing that down now to the work that I get to do with DLL and diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, we're a global company, we exist in 30 countries, and having a global international experience personally lends really, really well to the work that I get to do on a regular basis in um, having a very differentiated approach to the concepts of diversity and inclusion, because wherever you go in the world, those concepts and those words mean a little bit, something a little bit different. And I think it's important for us at DLL that we value that, we honor that, and we make sure that progress is taking everyone from point A to point B, regardless of what that point A is, seeing progress um, in, the, in the concepts that, we, that we're talking about here. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting. I have a, a similar experience uh, with both my children and dating, and uh, it was maybe eight years ago. I was dating, began dating someone, and you know, just like you, uh, you know, I, I got come to the point in life where I look at people as individuals, right? I, I don't make any blanket determinations or prejudgments. I let you show me who you are, right? Just like the universe does. And so I date this person and she was excited. And so she would tell me about when she would show people my photograph, oh, I'm dating him. And, you know, she's basically like, I had no idea that everybody feels this way. Cause they'd be like, oh, you know, you're such a lovely young lady. You can date anybody you want. Are you sure? <laughs> and then I was like, what? what's wrong with me? And I, and I told her, I'm like, please stop sharing this with me because, you know, I, I don't, you know, I like to be innocent. Um, yeah. yeah. So when you got to, do you feel, you say things are slightly different from country to country, okay? And I feel like things are very different from country to country because the identity basis of what, the base, you know, how they arrange their identity hierarchies tend to be different. So for example, I've been flat out called, so I think of myself with all the elements of my diversity, right? My, my you know, I'm a Mississippian, I'm a New Orleans, and I'm an African-American, I'm an American, I'm, you know, all these things, right? Um, and then there are some ways I don't define myself, but then others define you that way, <laughs> right? So in West Africa, they tell me I'm a white man all the time. So what has been your experience with identity on the international realm in comparison to America and even from place to place in America? Can you speak to, to experiences and how they vary? Yeah, I, I will say that um, I, I do say it's like I say it's slightly different because I think we're more common than we are different. I think while the, the constructs may be a little bit different as you described, we all have the same challenges. Um, it's just where that challenge lie, and I think it takes longer to get to where that challenge is, and depending on where you are. I do think that the constructs of identity are very different, um, specifically in Europe. Uh, than in uh, North America. But even when you think about Latin America, the concepts of identity and who you are are very different. Um, you know, I, I was talking to one of our colleagues who's the, the HR manager in Latin America and she's Brazilian. And she, we, were in the, we were in the US and she mentioned that she doesn't identify as Latina, she identifies as white. And that was eye-opening for me because we, you know, at in in the United States, we have you know Latinx, we have Hispanic, and she would have fallen into one of those groups. But she said that, you know, if I'm asked to check a box in my country, it is I am white because everyone everyone is Latina in Brazil. <laughs> in Brazil, <laughs> everyone is Latina in Brazil. Um, so it, with in, in the other part of it, when I think about Europe, it's your your leading identity is different. So when I think about the Netherlands, gender is not a leading identity in the Netherlands, which is very interesting. Whereas in the US, that's a leading identity for, for, for a lot of folks. Um, so I think, you know, as we continue to deconstruct 
and reconstruct the concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workplaces and within our workforces, we're going to have to be understanding what that looks like across as we become more of a global workforce and a global economy and the future of work, which is now, we're going to have to have these concepts within everything we do and be more culturally sensitive and culturally aware and culturally appreciative. Absolutely. I, I, I definitely agree. And, and it is eye opening, you know, and, and, and it's eye opening in many ways. For example, when you're a member of a group, you tend to be aware of every slight against that group, right? Every standard insult against that group and others may not be aware. So I'll give you an example of where a young lady was sort of cell phone years and years and years ago. I was watching this highly intellectual program called America's Next Top Model. And there was this African-American young lady who had grown up without interacting with African-Americans, all right? And then there was a group of African-American young women who had grown up interacting with African-Americans a ton, right? So the one who had not wasn't aware of certain uh, slights, right, and, and epithets. And so she looks at one of her photographs, and I'm not going to say what she said, but she looks at it and she goes, oh my God, I look like a, you know, not knowing that what she was saying was a standard racial epithet. And all the other girls looked at her and were like, what the, you know, they were highly offended. And so, you know, I, I feel like, you know, there's two sides to this, right? On one side, you know, we have to, we don't want to offend, right? We don't want to offend and we don't want to microaggress. But then on the other hand, right, when these things do happen, there's a range of responses, okay? And of course, there's always an interaction. So, and given, how every each person is at that moment in their life, right? It could be a teaching moment. Like for sometimes a friend says something, right? Because most of us in the world, I, I would imagine in America, we surround ourselves with a diverse community of people. And so a friend says something who's not a member of any identity group I'm from, and I'll just tell them, I'm like, hey, just so you know, that's a standard <laughs> insult, right? And they're like, oh, really? You know, and, and the same has happened to me. Um, and so I guess the question is, how do we how do we get there, Justin? Because you know it, it, it's so hard disentangling everything that you don't know. Yeah, no, I think um, so. One of the books that I'm currently reading is I think it's 25 Habits for Culturally Effective People. And it's like, what if I say the wrong thing, right? Because I think we are conditioned today in a, in a very interconnected and social media world. You don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't, so then most people just don't say anything, which is also wrong, right? And so I think it's sending, spending the time to educate yourself um, and also being in a place of um, being able to accept that criticism. And so I'll give you an example. So earlier today I was on a call and I used the term low hanging fruit and low hanging fruit has some connotations to it. And I caught myself in the moment and I knew I shouldn't have said it, but it had been ingrained <laughs> in me. Tell us what it means. I didn't know that. Please. You know, I, I would have to pro probably come back to the audience on that, to be honest, because I, I would have to do some research. But I was educated maybe a year ago that, you know, that's probably not the best term. Use a different term. Use quick wins. Fine. Great. So I think it's it's all about, you know, when you're when someone says, hey, that's that's offensive. And here's why um, they're calling you in. They're not calling you out. They're saying I would love I would love for you to be able to use re, be culturally sensitive in this way. And here's let me educate you on something that you probably didn't know. And I think it's being able to say, you know, thank you so much. I didn't know that and I will be better. And so if that person hadn't had shared that with me a year ago, I wouldn't have known when I used it today, oh, that wasn't the right word. I apologize for that in the moment. I did apologize for that in the moment. That wasn't the right, I didn't, I didn't mean to say that that wasn't the right frame of, frame of words. I, I, what I meant to say was quick wins. And I think, you know, those micro affirmations, I'm trying and I'm doing my best is what I'm saying when I correct myself. I'm trying, I'm doing my best and, and help me along this, this journey. Um, that's what we need to do. We need people to call you in and not call you out. We need to counter those microaggressions with microaffirmations and saying, you know, um, uh, Lexi was, was finishing her thought. I'd love for her to finish her thought or someone else in that room when you're cut off, which tends to happen with sales and marketing folks um, quite a bit. Um, how do you, how do you uh, combat those microaggressions with microaffirmations in the moment? And I think that will create a better culture in your organization and in our world. You know what? I'm loving everyone. Lexi, how are you going to follow this? They, these, everyone has done so well. And Christopher, I just want to say, I said 12 minutes per person, but you only got eight because, you know, there was a four. Okay. Minute. 
That's quite all right. That's quite all right. All right, Justin, thank you for all of that. And and every every one of you have just been so good. Lexi, you are my favorite dressman in the world. I just want you to know that. <laughs> there are actually more of us than you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I take it that, uh, you know, I had a friend of German heritage in the past. And he said to me, if the name ends in ER, it's typically British or German. And if you know what comes before it, like Walk Walker, it's Brit, it's British. And if you don't like his name, Ratner, it's German. So, is Dressman and the name that derived from an occupation? It is. <laughs> you are spot on. It is German, and I come from a family of tailors long, long ago. So, um, yes, it was originally Dressman. Um, yeah. So good, good job. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. So, Lexi, again, you're our first female speaker, uh, and you are living in the same country that we are, and you're a part of this um, economic community, and you have your own experiences um, from your your home as well as in the, your professional community. So, please, the floor is yours. Please share. Yeah, I think actually, um, thank you, just like everyone else has said, for having me on the panel. I'm honored. Um, a little nervous, if I'm being completely honest, because while I have been a panelist before, this is more personal. This isn't just me talking about, you know, the law of equipment finance. This is me sharing stories. So the, the thing I'd really like to get across is just that it's okay to talk. I think um, the prior panelists have all touched on that. But I am just sharing my stories in an effort to hope to shed light on some of the unconscious bias that I have faced, some of the unconscious bias that I have, and also just making sure everyone knows that it, it's okay to talk about it. Um, a little bit about yeah. myself. Sorry, go May ahead. I stop right quick. You just said that you're going to talk about some of the unconscious bias that you have, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. And that is, that's hard. That's hard for people to admit. And I think that goes to my background. I grew up in a uh, predominantly Caucasian area. And on top of that, I went to a Catholic school. So to be completely candid, I did not think that anybody that was not white and Catholic really existed in the world until probably high school or um, even college. I grew up like Delroy in a, a family that, that did that was Christian based and that taught that everyone is equal. But in my head, I think I took that in as though there's other people that are out there that aren't in your direct life. They're not in your direct space. So yes, there are people of different colors, different religions, different everything, but they weren't directly impacting my life. So it took me having my own personal experiences to kind of understand the role that I play in this. Um, uh, when I started in college, my roommate uh, happened to be biracial. She was white and African-American. And the first experience that I ever really had with, um, I don't want to call it racism, but I would, it, it was probably unconscious, uh, a little bit more than unconscious bias, somewhere in the, it's a gray area, but we would go out on double dates. Her boyfriend was white and I never realized my boyfriend and I never got asked, would you like a separate check? Are you together? Any of those kinds of common questions that people might have never got directed towards us, but they were always asked of my roommate who is biracial and her white boyfriend. And that never even dawned on me until she pointed it out. And at that time, I realized I had a role to play in this, that I didn't even notice that she got treated differently than I did solely because of the color of her skin. So fast forward a little bit, and I actually um, became a public defender. That's the first job I had out of law school. I was a public defender in downtown Cincinnati, which is pre predominantly minority. And I noticed my own unconscious bias the most then. Up until this point in my life, I wasn't, I never thought of myself as racist, but I wasn't part of this problem. This didn't have anything to do with me. I felt guilt over being part of a race that had been treated the had been treated the best historically. I was a history major, so I was a student of the reparations that weren't made, those kind of things, but this wasn't really my problem. And then I became a public defender. 
And I started noticing that what I was doing was as my cases come in, you've heard, um, you know, a public defender is someone that's appointed to you if you can't afford an attorney. So your caseload is just incredible. And so you don't meet your clients until oftentimes you're in a courtroom. And I could go on and on about those issues, but I would notice that the names would come in and the offenses, that's all I had to work with. And I would start forming pictures in my head, similar to the flip of what Delroy experienced. I would start noticing that, well, if this person has a heroin charge, I'm gonna say that they're probably from the Kentucky side of the border and they're white. If this person's name is African-American sounding, like maybe it starts with a D, I probably did that, then I'm gonna pick, form a picture in my head of them being black. And I, I hated that about myself. I felt absolutely horrible and guilty that I was starting to form these. So I think at that moment in time, combined with the things that I was noticing about the system, I was a part of a, the system. And so I started to learn about the issues of systemic racism, systemic bias. And I decided that I wanted to be part of the solution and not act like this wasn't my problem because it is my problem. It is my issue. I am a minority. I'm not a woman, a woman of color, but I am a woman and we're all working together. And so I took it upon myself really to just start to educate myself. That was the first thing that I wanted to do. I didn't know what else to do. I'm a student, when in doubt, read books. Um, so I just, I started, I have a whole slew of books that I'm happy to recommend to anyone, but I am a big proponent of reading anything that I can to get a better idea of something I wasn't familiar with myself. I had never taken the time up until that point to learn about systemic bias. I read the new Jim Crow laws. Um, that was kind of what opened my eyes. And so I think that was the, the first time where I started to realize it's okay to to learn about these issues and to talk about them. But then I had to go a step further and I had to start realizing that it's not enough to just educate myself. I need to realize that if I'm silent about the discussions that are going on around me, I'm not be being a part of the solution. So I decided that I was going to start talking and speaking out about some of the things that were going on around me. It's not enough to just listen, but you have to act on things. And I don't, I'm lucky enough, I guess, to not have to have come across outright racism very often. Perhaps in my career as a public defender, I did, but not in my personal life. But what I did come across a lot was the, the people that would make jokes people that would make jokes that were supposed to be funny. We're all familiar probably with the Key and Peel, the Key and Peel, um, A.A. Ron. Uh, if you're not, ping me afterwards, I'll, I'll <laughs> but that was, that was like a running joke in my family. And it, I started to realize that it's okay to laugh at things, but also to address things that aren't really funny, if that makes sense. Um, so I would just start, I didn't want to be aggressive and turn people away like Justin was talking about. I wanted to bring people into the conversation, not turn them away. So it's kind of, as you can see on the slide here, my catchphrase now is, why do you think that's funny? Just to get an idea of where people's heads are and so we can have a more comfortable conversation. So my background started out with me thinking I wasn't, this wasn't my issue. I didn't need to be part of the solution. And as I expanded my worldview, I have also been um, studied abroad, been, uh, you know, been outside of the country. And that really helped me realize that I need to be part of the solution and education and speaking and these types of environments and knowing that it's okay like Justin said to flip up I don't know all of the I don't know all of the correct phrases even though I am trying to educate myself I don't know the lingo that is offensive that is not offensive I know myself and I know I never want to cause offense to somebody so I need to accept when people criticize me and I need to be able to speak candidly in these kinds of environments, knowing that we're all trying to get on the same page. So I, I have two questions, Lexi. So what you just said is something that I struggle with, right? Because I, I think there's a balance between feelings and justice, right? Like if somebody misbehaves, I'll give you an example, <laughs> okay? I, in the past, dated someone who was violent, right? Female, it's not something people talk about, right? man being attacked by a female. But what would happen is uh, twice she attacked me publicly and twice people came to her aid. I didn't lift a hand to defend myself in either case, right? 
but people came, you know, it's more of like remove myself from the danger, right? And there's two dangers for me. One is the physical, and the other is if this situation was misconstrued, right? Um, and so I feel like, you know, if somebody's like, and the reason why people would come to their aid because of the tears, because of the emotion, because I feel bad, right? And so if someone comes to you and is like, oh, I feel this way, but it's, you know, you know, like with kids, sometimes, you know, this is a, this is a tough, what I'm saying is every situation is not clear cut, right? There, there are some times where, uh, you know, things are on the border and, and you know, and it, anyway, I, I, I couldn't frame that nice and neatly enough. So I'll go on to the other person's question. And so from the audience, it is, uh, here we are, and we're talking about these things. And one of the things I like to say is, you know, if dolphins were 10 times more intelligent than humans, they still wouldn't be a technological civilization because they don't have hands, right? We're all a slave to the, our container. And part of that container is our plastic mental container, right? Um, and we, 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 we take these shortcuts. A lot of what people have talked about, these prejudging, is because we take a mental shortcut. And when we talk, and one of the mental shortcuts we have is that we talk about race and aggressions and things, and we use the word hate to characterize it. But what we're seeing is that mostly it's not hate, right? Um, and some people want to do better, but their uh, package that they're in have some anxiety. I've never talked to people like this. How do I get over that? Or I say it's something that was incorrect from that other person's perspective. I don't see it, but I want to apologize to them. How do I bridge that gap? Justin, sir, what do you have to say for, for, for this? Or Christopher, since we cut you off for minutes. Christopher, I'll let you go first. Yeah, listen, I, I think um, I think the core of your, if I understand the core of your question right, um, uh, Dr. Rowe, it, it's really around um, how do we get over or become more uh, comfortable with and be able to embrace that that fear of potentially, you know, um, addressing those items or addressing what that unknown is so that we can get more comfortable to see each other as individuals, right? Uh, and I, I just would encourage folks um, that, uh, and I think, I, I can't remember who said it on the panel, but they said it well, right, from a standpoint of um, it's okay. I think, Justin, and you, it might have been you uh, that talked about the idea of it's actually quite okay to educate um, someone to engage in that dialogue and to feel comfortable of explaining, um, you know, what the uh, your interpretation is or your understanding is, or even to be curious and just ask about well, uh, what actually does happen, right? Um, in whether it's your race or your religion what have you i think it's okay to um engage in that dialogue it is somewhat uncomfortable because we've um somewhat indoctrinated ourselves to the concept that it isn't politically correct or it isn't um you know something that we talk about at that uh at a workplace but um seeing individuals for who they are and being able to be um you know in engaging with that person to seek a better understanding, I think is the important uh, lesson that we're taking away from this, which is prejudging to your point, Dr. Rowe, is a shortcut. And you are typecasting everyone into a basket based on some psychological perspective that you might have. Seek to understand the individual, not the general generalization. Yeah, I think, Chris, the only thing that I would add is I would say is we have to start to see everyone as being part of the solution. And so racism is not a problem for people of ethnic minority. That is everyone's problem. We all have to be a solution. Feminism or sexism is everyone's responsibility to fix and be supportive of. Um, any phobias, that is our responsibility collectively to support and address and to um, be a solution towards. So. Uh, if you're not part of the solution, if you're you're sitting in that silent, I'm not sure what to say, you know, stand up uh, because someone wants you to help and be their supporter and to be their ally. 
What do you and, say for people that are more, you know, anxiety ridden type, you know, who don't, the last thing they want to do is, is stand up or, or, or speak out. Is there, are there more one-on-one -on -one ways or, or, you know, you mentioned the micro affirmations. Is there anything else? Yeah, I can certainly give um, some some suggestions, or we could someone someone else on the panel. But I think you know small ways of how you're spending your dollars in your personal life. Um, where are you putting? Are you putting? Are you supporting small businesses in your community? Are you supporting women-owned, minority-owned businesses? How are you spending the the powerful dollar in your communities? Um, how are you supporting your local? Um, local associations and things like that so I think there's there are there are less um, abrasive I guess or when you stand up and shout from the rooftops there's less for introverts in the world there are other ways that you could that you could support and be be allies in this space something and something I want to add to I think both Justin and Lexi touched on this um, briefly but I think it's also like when you are on the side of, of correcting the person or or you know, directing that person who just made that mistake. It's all in your delivery also to that person, not coming from your own place of aggression towards them, but being like, you know, in your head, remembering they might have just slipped up and made a mistake. They, they're probably not being intentional and, and your approach and how you handle it is gonna affect them probably for the rest of their lives. So like if you immediately jump down their throat, they're gonna have a negative uh, you know, experience going forward. Like I think of, um, and I think we talked about this maybe in like our webinar prep a little bit, but like I remember in high school, long before I came out, you know, people at that time would say things were gay all the time. And that was like a way to say something was like stupid, you know, like, oh, that's so gay. Why would you do that? Or something like that. Like that happened all the time. And I would just like, I would just let it go, let it go, let it go. I think that's a similar thing where most of those people weren't trying to directly offend gay people clearly it was this it was just the slang of the time and i think i remember one of the times i finally corrected it was after i came out it was in college and one of my good friends actually used it and my approach to correcting was just like oh and by saying that's gay you you clearly mean it's like incredibly fabulous uh, because that's what i am and i just remember like his response to that was so good like from then on a he never used that's so gay but he also was like, he knew it came from a place of like, I'm just trying to like help direct it a little bit. Um, and I think that approach can really make a profound impact on people. You know, a similar one to that that I hear often is a lot of people from other countries will say American when they mean white person, white American. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Lexi, I feel like you're left out, say something. I was actually going to make a real world recommendation uh, to go along with Justin's. I'm the YMCA in my community, so I'm assuming in most communities, does a great job with their initiatives in DEI. And there's things that you can do through the YMCA specific, and I'm not on their board or anything. This isn't an advertisement, but I right now there's like a 21 day challenge that you can get started on. And for the whole month of March, every day they send me articles that I can read. It's how I started reading the newest book. And you don't like Justin said for those of for those people that are a little bit more introverted, you don't have to get up, you know, you don't have to get on a panel and start talking about your personal stories. But there are other ways to get involved. And I, I would recommend looking in your community. Churches often are very, very good at having discussion groups. Um, just two real world examples. Yeah. But, but by the way, I think the other thing um, for folks who are um, naturally more shy or quiet. Um, while I would encourage to to stand up and speak out um, in the right way, right, that feels comfortable uh, for them, there is always the opportunity to, whether it's um, your family, your children, you know, you have uh, the ability to make a lasting impact, uh, whether it's uh, mentors that you are mentees that you would have. Um, there are a lot of ways in which you, on a day-to-day -day basis, help to teach, shape, um, mold uh, people. And um, that's something that's a powerful platform that I wouldn't underestimate. Well, to the end now. So what I'm going to do is read a couple of uh, things from the audience. One says, not a question, 
Uh, but thank you to everyone for being so vulnerable. That's what they meant. They said, yeah, vulnerable during the conversation. Everyone gave fantastic real life stories that resonate so well. Thank you for your professionalism, candor, and view into the actual life on these difficult topics. And another question is, this person says, I'm Asian and I feel left out of the BLM movement. I see more white people are overly nice to black brown people, but they are still not to me slash Asian. Some black brown people are discriminatory to, discriminatory to us as if to say that we are lower than them. Do you think there is that racial discrimination in the black brown community against Asians, Native Americans? All right, so I'll start and then open it to the four of you. Um, the one thing I wanna say is, it, it's sort of written like a blanket statement, right? And so I would say that all of the communities are made up of individuals and, every, every, and, and, and if you distribute those individuals based on racial to tolerance or anything, you probably get a Gaussian out, right? for every group of people. Um, and so I do think that uh, there is tribalism in America from group to group. Uh, and, and then there's other groups that are the opposite of that, right? I've lived, I've been to 47 of the states and lived in, in, in many of them. And I do see that there are, are geographical trends, but within geography, you know, if you go inside of a state, there are bubbles of highly tolerant and highly intolerant people. But as far as in general, I find people of all nationalities and colors and races and religions to be wonderful. That's my experience with people in general. Um, and you know, if you, you name a race, I can't. I could name you twenty amazing people immediately, right? Uh, and so I think that if you have a perspective on a race, then it's probably biased if it's not a spectrum. Or, or a distribution, right? Now, I, I can't think of a single blanket statement I can make about any race, gender, or, or anything that holds up, uh, you know, as far as behavior, culture, any of these things go. Um, thought, it, we're all, we, there's a lot of diversity in the diversity. So you may have had encountered <laughs> a, a biased uh, sample from the, from the whole, but I think that if you were to um, take a tour of America, you will find that most people will be very warm to you. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I think I think people in any minority or or majority can be discriminatory against someone else. I don't think necessarily it's a one way street at all. Um, I think it can go multiple ways. And so, like you said, um, Dr. O, I'm sure you know that person probably had an interaction with somebody, or and, and I'm sure it happens a lot that that Asians get discriminated against as well, or Asian Americans. And I think it just comes back to, I think the BLM movement has been on the top of our minds, obviously from, from last year, especially the, the happenings of last year. So, but it doesn't, it doesn't negate the fact that there, there are many different types of racism and sexism that, that still are prevalent um, on top of the BLM movement. So I think it's just addressing everything we come in, into contact with. Yeah, I think it's right, Delroy, and I also think that the BLM movement does not um, justify any kind of discriminatory practices between one group and another. It's not about that. Um, I think, Dr. Rowe, your point that you made with respect to, um, you know, listen, racism or bias, um, generally speaking, comes from a part, a point of the unknown or this, this fear, right? And for sure, there are pockets where I think black and brown communities don't mix as much with um, uh, Asian American or Native American communities, but there are others that are quite uh, the opposite. Um, I would tell you, um, uh, I, I have spent a, a large chunk of my life uh, in, in Asia. Um, uh, working and living there. And um, uh, it is, I think of Japan as my second home, right? A um, uh, tremendous number of um, friends and um, uh, folks that I continue to engage with to this day, right? Uh, and those are some of the deepest, um, you know, connections uh, that I would ever, I can tell you that I've, I've had uh, in my life. So, 
Um, it's not a universal thing. It's, uh, I think, may have been an unfortunate circumstance, but not something that's universal. The only thing I would add from a from a Black Lives Matter standpoint is the, the Black Lives Matter movement was in response to a very specific uh, need and an, an activism from a specific issue. Now, I do believe that there is this very uh, specific issue, specifically in the U.S. Um, since March, of violence and discrimination against the Asian American communities. Um, and I think we should stand up for that. And I think what we, what we, what we shouldn't do, though, is say, because I don't see myself in this movement, I feel left out. No, no, it's a both. It's a, there is a problem here, which the Black Lives Matter is trying to solve, but there's also a problem over here, which is this disproportionate and alarming um, racism and violence against the Asian American community, which we also need to address. So it's not an either or, it's both. And we need to start seeing it that way, I think, so that we can, uh, so that, you know, the tide raises all boats and not just one or the other. Excellent, excellent. I'm going to turn the floor back over to Emily now. Um, I, I want to thank all our panelists as well as our audience. You all have done an amazing job. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I feel, to be honest with you, I feel cheated. I just want to talk to each one of you for like three hours each. So. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome if we could have just a whole day of discussions on this. Uh, again, I'd like to echo thoughts from our audience and Hakeem, thank you all so much for being on this panel. It was excellent hearing all of your personal experiences and thoughts. Um, I'd also like to thank the attendees. I hope you found um, a few helpful stories and you know things that you could take into your personal life and learn and grow. Um, so after this session, um, You'll receive a survey. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you take a moment, to fill it out, and let us know your thoughts for today. Um, for further education, um, the ELFA Equality Committee actually has a downloadable toolkit. It's available in the handouts panel for you. Um, it includes, you know, business case for diversity and inclusion, some key definitions, and many other resources and learning tools. Um, we also have here a link to the Project Implicit Test from Harvard University. I believe that is the one that Dr. Hakeem mentioned. Um, we also have a couple other webinars that the Equality Committee has put on. Um, one on the, an, an introduction to unconscious bias. If you are somewhat unfamiliar with the topic and like a little bit more education, you can do that. As well as the bold conversations to affect positive change, striving for equality. Uh, let's see here. We also, ooh, oh my goodness, I think I exit. There we go. Sorry, here is the recommended list of books from Lexi. Uh, once again, these slides are available to download, so don't don't fear. You can you don't need to jot these down quickly. Um, and so, what's next for all of us here? Um, please please be sure to join us tomorrow evening for the rescheduled ELFA Equality Virtual Networking Event. Um, where you can discuss what we've just heard today and more. Also next week is the ELFA CFO Roundtable webinar and registration information for both of those events are available on our website. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to all our attendees and our panelists. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.